<laughs> For those of you who are a little concerned right now, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. And if you're super spiritual, you say it like this, the joy of the Lord is our strength. But if you've experienced the power and the presence of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and this is what it looks like. Amen. If you cannot enjoy your life, if you can't celebrate the fact that a British man on American soil lasted another year, then you are truly <laughs> impoverished in your spirit. <laughs> I want to invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to cover the whole chapter. I doubt we're going to cover it all today. <laughs> when I finished the outline, my goal was to get it all in one shot. But as, and I know you do this too, as it rolled around in my mind and looking at the text over and over, I realized that I do not have the ability to do it in such a short amount of time. I know you are shocked. So by God's grace, we'll only torture you with this for two weeks. Um, I want to deal with a topic. Uh, how do you live in Babylon? Yes. Yeah. Now, some of you have been working alongside of me for a decade and a half. <laughs> and you know that I have always, and still do, take a very strong stance against using the pulpit for politics. Yes. The pulpit is about Jesus, yes, it is. not about politics. Yes. And so today you may believe that I'm breaking that rule. I don't think I am. Because what I want to deal with is not a political party. It has nothing to do with the name of anyone sitting in a seat of power anywhere at any level of government. It has to do with the fact that on God's timeline, we are moving ever closer, and it seems ever quicker, toward a time the Bible calls the tribulation. And in this time, the Babylonian system is going to be in full sway. Uh, the Old Testament speaks of it, not just in Daniel. The New Testament speaks of it, not just in Revelation. It is the idea of the powers that be coming against God's kids in attempt to force them to conform or to eliminate them. When you look at the book of Revelation, you see this occurring. In Daniel, we have the situation of thousands, thousands of people being forced into a governmental system that wasn't just against their belief system, but actively working to conform or destroy them. And at the risk of you can tell I'm a little nervous doing this, uh, at the risk of even sounding slightly political. I believe that America is very quickly taking on the traits of Babylon. Now this is part of God's plan. God is not in heaven going, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? All of us want the second coming of Jesus. Now, the older I get, and the more bills I have, <laughs> the more I look forward to the second coming of Jesus. So I watch my grandchildren, the culture they're growing up in. I pray, even so, Lord, come quickly. But for that to happen, all of God's timeline needs to be included, and that includes a time of global I don't even know this is a word. I may be making this up. So if I ever to use it, you owe me 50 cents because I'm trademarking it. Global Babylonianism. Where the world functions as Babylon did under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. For that to happen, every strong, financially independent, 
citizen-led country must be diminished or else the world leader cannot take global control. What we are seeing take place in America is not the result of Democrats. It is not the result of Republicans. It is not the result of independents. It is not the result of who sits on benches around our country. It is the result of divine providence. For a global leader to emerge, countries like America must diminish and be replaced with the spirit of Babylon. A spirit is not a demonic spirit, it is an attitude of Babylon. We look at the book of Daniel and we can see parallels to what is happening to Christians in America today. You may not see that. You might think I'm over the top. And if you do, I just ask for your forgiveness. I don't bring this lightly. And it's not a topic that I enjoy because it does include politics, which I don't think belongs in the church. But I'm not dealing with politics. I'm dealing with anti-biblical policy. And that may be a fine line, and if it is, forgive me. Notice what takes place in verse 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. Notice, besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands of the king, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessel into the treasury of his God. What's amazing about this situation is that, as we know, it included at least four men that we get to know. We call them Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What we often don't realize, and what scholars and historians have shared with us, is that Daniel and these three friends of his were most likely 15 to 17 years old when this happened. This was not the last time that Nebuchadnezzar moved onto Israel's soil and besieged it and destroyed it. This happened in 605 B.C. I know that's why you came to church. But two more times, in 597 and 586, he came and finished what he started. It's important for us to grasp that concept. Because what is happening to the American church today, at large, is the attitude and the atmosphere of Babylon has besieged us. They haven't come in and wiped us out. But they have fenced us in with rules and regulations and policies. The public agenda is against God's people. At least you think that somehow we are faultless. I believe that the American church has much to be accountable for, just as Jehoiakim, the king of Israel, had. The reason that Nebuchadnezzar came three times against this country was because God allowed it. And God allowed it because the majority of those in leadership were not living for God. I love the church. I have been a part of the church since July 13th, 1983 when God saved me. But I am not blind. Except the dishes in the sink. <laughs> If we look at the leadership of the church in America, those with the largest voice, those with the greatest influence, we see a church that resembles Jerusalem in 605 B.C. We love the trappings of religion, but we do not want God to be our God. We want him to be our genie. 
And so one of the aspects of the rise of the Babylonian atmosphere around the world in the United States is, is in part due to the failure of much of the American church. Now, not everybody in Jerusalem had followed along, just like not every church in America follows along. But think about this. Major voices in the American church, the ones who get in the magazines, the television, and the radio, major, major voices are now declaring that Christ is not the only way to salvation. They are claiming that the Bible is a good book, but it is not the good book. They are claiming by their own voice that God is not concerned with your moral purity as long as your heart is in the right place. There are even some who have gone so far as to say abortion may be a gift from God. When those in power in the religious community fail God, God will not be silent for long. And so part of the issue that we find ourselves in in America has nothing to do with political parties. But it has everything to do with the failure of God's people to live for God. Daniel and his friends that we see here were part of a group that loved God. But they were swept up in the besiegement because they were part of God's nation. There is a huge aspect of the American church that still believes God's word is true. Jesus is the way of salvation. There is right and there is wrong. Sacrifice for others is more important than gaining for yourself. We still believe. And yet we are being caught up in the besiegement of a Babylonian mentality along with everyone else. What we see taking place in verses 3 to 7, try to say this properly. There's no way to say it. There is political overtone to this. Forgive me. We see Daniel and the others were being forced into a politically correct training system. Mm -hmm. we, we often miss that because we just read through Daniel, look, they did this, and God blessed them. Hallelujah. And next thing you know, you know. Three guys are walking in the fire, and the, and the Son of God's there with them. Isn't that great? Daniel goes to lion den and ends up with pets. I mean, just wow, look at all this stuff. But nowhere in this section is God speaking to Daniel and his friends. Mm -hmm. They were forced into a politically correct training system. Remember, Babylon was just like everywhere else in the Middle East. It was political and religious. You couldn't separate the two. And so while we look at this from a Western viewpoint and say, oh, they were being put into a religious training program, we are right, but we miss that it is also a political way of thinking. They were being retrained to think like Babylonians rather than Hebrews. And my greatest fear as a follower of Jesus Christ in America in the 21st century is that many in God's house are succumbing to the political retraining of the Babylonian system around us. Watch with me what happens. Then the king ordered Asaph, the chief of the officials, to bring some of the sons of Israel, including of the royal family and the nobles. You know, you and I are called part of the royal family. Yes. We're called royal priests. There is no coincidence here. This is a historical event, but it has prophetic overtones. They were brought because they were the best of the best. They were smart. They were free thinkers. They had the ability and the training in Hebrew to get things done, and what they wanted to do was to take that drive and passion and reorient it so that they now promoted Babylonianism instead of the Hebrew lifestyle. 
You and I are a royal priesthood. And what the ungodly would like more than anything else, those who are in power around our country would like more than anything else, is not to destroy us, but to get such motivated, self-sacrificing men and women as we find in churches across this country to begin to use their energies for their system rather than God's. We are at the beginning stages of a political reorienting of God's church in America. It's important to understand, they did not ask to be there. We did not ask to be here. But God had a plan. I cannot be the only one who's excited about that. God yes. had a plan. Yes. See, Nebuchadnezzar had a plan. Yes. But God, the creator of heaven and earth, also had a plan. And God was using Nebuchadnezzar's plan, let me say it this way, the Babylonian approach to bring about God's presence in the midst of a wicked environment. There are those in America who would like us to bow down to their creeds. But God has allowed us to live at such a time as this. So that we can be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They brought us into this, but God is going to bring himself through this. Amen. This is not a disaster. This is an opportunity. We love to quote Paul that he has fought the good fight of faith while we sit on our couch with the remote eating pizza. I do that. Some of us have been in fights. Not me, of course, I'm a sweetheart. Some of us have been in fights. And whether you win or lose, you get hurt. Some of us have scars in various locations of our body that when we see them, remind us of that time. A good fight is not one in which we do not walk away with bruises and scars and cuts. Christian, hear me. A good fight is one you win. And Paul, who fought for the gospel in horrible Babylonian-style circumstances, is able to write at the end of his life, I have fought the good fight. What is he saying? I won! They tried to reprogram me. They tried to break me. They tried to imprison me. They tried to change me. But look at me standing here on the finish line, gazing into heaven. I still believe. And I believe that God is raising up in this generation men and women of every age who are able on that last day to say to Christ when they look him in the eye, I still believe. Verse 4. Youth in whom there is no defect, who were good looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding, discerning knowledge, those who had the ability to serve, watch the king's court. Not the willingness, the ability. Watch what Nebuchadnezzar does. Nebuchadnezzar ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The literature and the language of the Babylonians. I'm trying to be careful. Not my forte. The mass media on large, not all, is trying to retrain us in the literature and the language of sin. Yes. In the literature and the language of submission. In the literature and the language of fear. Yes. We are systematically being bombarded with the language and the literature of Babylonian thinking in America. And it is by design. 
The king appointed them a daily ration of the king's what? Choice food. That's the good stuff. That's not microwave. That's made from scratch. And from the wine which the king drank, again, that's the good stuff, not the twist-off cap. Actually, has a cork in it. <laughs> Sorry, I used to be an alcoholic. <laughs> That they should be educated. Educated. They should be educated for three years. They're already educated. What is this? Reprogramming. And at the end of which, they were to enter the king's personal service. There's the goal. The Babylonian mindset is to take the best of us, God's kids, to retrain us, and dare I say, bribe us, the choicest foods. You're not going to be slandered. You're not going to be mocked because, after all, you're one of us, even though you say Jesus' name. We know what you mean. So they're bribing them. They're reprogramming them for a specific task to serve the king's court. The goal of the Babylonian Empire, we see it again in the book of Revelation, is not that the government protects and provides for the people, rather that the people protect and provide for their government. Right. And we are seeing glimpses of that around the world, and we are seeing it, unfortunately, in America today. We are living in a day where those who will capitulate to the Babylonian dictates will receive favor from the leadership, and those who will stand firm for the truths of Jesus Christ will suffer. Now among them were three sons of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Hazariah. You didn't even know I could say that, did you? <laughs> Daniel means God is my judge, and Hananiah means the Lord is gracious. Mishael means, who is like my God? And Azariah means, the Lord helps. That's their names. Every time they said their names, that was what they were saying. Even their names were focused on who God was. You, as a savior, a saved person by Jesus Christ, have been given a new name. It's already waiting for you in glory. God calls you redeemed. God calls you valuable. God calls you worthwhile. God calls you a king and a prince. God calls you to be a prophet and a priest. God calls you those things. But that will not work for the Babylonian system. Part of the retraining is to get us to view ourselves differently than the way God does. And it starts with name calling. We live in an age where those in power, not political party, don't misunderstand, those in power have reduced us to name call. We are not called children of God in their circles. We are not called faithful servants of the community in their circles. In their circles, we are called terrorists. We are called radicals. We are called brainwashed, which I find highly ironic considering what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. We are called imbeciles. We are, calling, we are called dinosaurs who need to go extinct. I did not make that up. We are in a nation as it follows God's plan for the second coming that is beginning to express itself in the Babylonian way, and it includes speaking of us differently than God does. I wrote the names down because I always get them mixed up. Daniel is called Belshazzar, which, I mean, it's a cool name. If you don't know what it means, that, that Belshazzar, I mean, I can't spell it, but man, isn't that cool? It means the servant of Bel, their chief god. They changed his name. And I 
was changed to Shadrach, which means inspired by the sun god. Mishael was changed to Meshach, sorry. And it means who is like the moon god. And Azariah was changed to Abednego, but we're Americans, so Abednego. That means a servant of the Lord, their gods. This is significant because if they could get God's people to view themselves, watch, not as living in Babylon, but as Babylonians, then the mind change is done. If our government can get us to view ourselves the way we are portrayed, their work is done. We are ready to submit to whatever plans will come. There is no, there is a little, but it's inferred, not direct, proof that when these three men or four men were alone together, they referred to themselves by their Hebrew names, not by their Babylonian names. One of the reasons that church attendance and getting to know people at church will become increasingly valuable is because churches, biblical churches, will be the one safe place where we will be able to call each other by the name God has given us rather than see ourselves the way the Babylonians see us. Church is not just about sleeping for 30 minutes while pastors preach. Church is about family, coming together, sharing our lives, our hurts, our joys, getting to know each other as God's kids, because at the end of service, we're all walking back out into Babylon. We didn't get very far. And I hope you hear my heart. I'm not belittling any political party. I'm looking beyond that to the plan of God and the system that not is, is not coming, but is here and growing. As we move closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ, we can be like these four men who, no matter what they're called, live for God and bring an evangelism to their lifestyle. Or we can be like, and some have estimated, the other thousand or so who were just like these men, who received names like these men, and are never mentioned in Scripture again. They faded off because they gave in to the perks of following the system. They gave in because perhaps they felt like God had abandoned them, and I guess this is how we do it now. They gave in, and we hear nothing of them. But these four men, who were not rude, they were not disrespectful, they did not carry guns and go shoot people, they served God in the role they were consigned to. And as a result, God did miraculous things through all four of these men. You and I are living in the beginning days of Babylon. My question for you is, who will you be? These four men or the other thousand? Will you be remembered as one who stood up and fought the good fight of faith? Or will you be wiped away from the memories of those around you because you became just another sheep that they herded into the pen? If you're watching today or you're here and you're not a follower of Lord Jesus Christ, I am urging you to give your life to him. The days are moving quickly before Christ's return. Christ gave his son to die and rise from the dead so that he could forgive us of our sin, our selfishness, living as if God does not matter, so that he could put into us joy, peace, and purpose, even in a Babylonian empire. If you're ready to give your life to Christ to receive those things, I'm going to ask you to pray with me now. Father, please forgive me of the sin of living as if you don't matter. Come into my life and be my God promise to serve you the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that here or watching, I'm asking you to tell somebody today because there's a blessing that comes with that. 
If you've done it watching like so many others, send me a note. I'm going to get you some information that will help you in your new relationship with Jesus. Now, Christian, not the happiest message I've ever spoken. But as a minister, as your pastor, I feel an obligation to teach the whole truth of God, not just the warm fuzzies. I want to be able to tell you that what we're experiencing as a nation and God's people in a nation is just a blip on the screen and everything's going to go back the way it was. Scripture does not indicate that. Scripture indicates that before the sun returns, days will grow dark, days will grow evil, that bad will be called good and good will be called bad. That they will praise each other to their evil. And we are seeing that begin now. But I have good news for you. Christ, who has a plan for the whole universe, included as part of that plan, you being born when you were. If you're Pastor Steve, that was 89 years ago. And he had a plan for you to be born where you were so that like Ruth, you could come into the kingdom for such a time as this. This is not the time to duck and hide. This is the time to stand up and say, I believe in Jesus. I am a part of a church. I read my Bible and I sacrifice for my community. This is the time to fight so that when we stand before him, battle-scarred and bloody perhaps, we will look 